He was taking pills. He knew that there were pressed pills out there, but I don't think he knew the severity of fentanyl. I don't think fentanyl ever even crossed his mind. He just knew that they were pressed pills. And even before, you know, it struck our family, I didn't really know much about fentanyl. All of a sudden, now you see fentanyl all on the news, and but you don't realize you don't know and become knowledgeable about it until it actually hits home. And I think that's what what it was, is he just knew that they were pressed pills. He didn't know the dangers of taking a pressed pill and it possibly having fentanyl in it. It started with marijuana and then he just slowly started experimenting with other things, you know, mushrooms, you know, LSD, you know, just anything. He w- he just experimented with drugs, and, and it's, it became to the point, you know, he relied on the opioids. And it feels like it just all happened so fast. Like, right bef- like right when we started noticing the signs... It was too late. It was too late. I'll never forget my brother being carried out in a black body bag. His name was Cesar Luis Alvarez, and we called him Nuno. It was a childhood name that my younger sister came up with. Growing up, Nuno was just very quiet, kept to himself a lot. He loved to read books, play video games, you know, just the average kid. I mean, this kid literally read thousands of books. I mean, he was, he just knew a little bit about everything. I mean, and it just goes into, you know, how much he read because of the knowledge he had. He loved history. He loved, I mean, you name it, and he he knew it. He was smart. I mean, he always just kind of kept his head down, did what he was supposed to do, you know, graduated high school, and just tried to do the best that he could with what he had. You know, We went through a lot of things growing up, a lot of trauma, abuse, exposed to a lot of things that we shouldn't have seen. Um, But he was a really good kid. He was, like I said, he was just quiet, kept to himself, but he was always that kid that just was selfless in every aspect. I mean, loving no matter what anybody did to him or if somebody caused any harm, he was just... He never held any grudges against anybody. He was that that mutual person. Like if, you know, if family was having any friction, he would, you know, um, just find understanding in everybody. Very forgiving. He had the purest heart. Purest. His smile. <laughs> And I know a lot of people say it's their smile, but he literally, anything he was going through, you know, he could be experiencing his own trauma, but he literally carried that smile no matter what he felt inside. You would never know. So as I mentioned, growing up, you know, we were exposed to a lot of trauma. I mean, still. You know, our family, my mother was in prison for 14 years of our adolescent life. Um, We had the substance abuse. There was sexual abuse. There was, you know, we were just exposed to anything that you can possibly imagine. We were exposed to it growing up. And I think that's when he started experimenting with drugs He had a couple of overdoses, apparently, and 
I wasn't aware of them, and they would come out to his grandma's house and revive him. He would be admitted to the hospital, but I don't know if he was not letting family in at the time or what, but for me, he was explaining it to me as being, um, you know, heart issues or things of that nature. The one prior leading up to his death, he actually told me about. I asked him if he wanted me to go pick him up because I would have dropped everything to go pick him up. But his girlfriend at the time, um, he said that, you know, he was going to go spend some time with her or whatnot. Um, but he actually admitted it to me. He told me that he did have an overdose. Um, he was very depressed, very depressed. And I think the drugs ultimately, um, you know, it made it worse. So he just relied on the drugs. <laughs> and it just opened those additional wounds that he had from our childhood. And I'm speaking on behalf of what he shared with me, not just assuming, not assuming, I'm not assuming anything. My brother shared a lot with me and I know that that hurt him a lot. And I tried to be there for him. I tried so hard to encourage him and to be his positive, you know, support, you know, because I always like, I, I knew my brother was capable. He had so much potential to be somebody great. He was smart. <sighs> but unfortunately, our trauma that we experienced as kids, it just took over him. And it's genetic disposition, unfortunately. I mean, the the drug addiction doesn't start with him, and it didn't end with him. It started generations before him. It was Sunday, December 4th. I'll never forget. He wanted to hang out. The Dallas Cowboys were playing and he loved the Dallas Cowboys. And he wanted to come over and watch the game either at my house or my uncle's house. And that was the plan. But... <laughs> I kind of held back a little bit because some personal issues, you know, uh, but I remember feeling that day, like I felt so lonely and I couldn't figure out why, like why I felt so alone and he was supposed to go to my uncle's house to watch the game. Well, I don't know what happened, but he decided to cancel going to my uncle's house and stayed behind in his area, in the Garland Mesquite area, hung out with his friends. They went to go eat. Um, and from what I'm told is that, you know, that they had a couple of drinks or whatnot. And then Monday morning, December 5th, his girlfriend woke up and realized that he was unconscious and that's the day I got the call that my brother had passed away. I'll never forget getting the news. My sister called me. It was like 7.20 in the morning. I was getting ready. I was hesitant on even answering the phone call because I have, you know, it was just a busy morning, my morning routine. But I answered the phone and she said, Lisette, something bad happened. And she just said, all I remember her saying, no, no. <laughs> and I just dropped to the floor and I couldn't, I mean, when you're in that position and you lose somebody that you love with all your heart, you're in disbelief. And you don't know what's happening. I mean, it's literally like you're 
Like, you're not even actually present. And, I mean, I just dropped everything, and I went straight to uh, his house, at his grandma's house. I rushed straight over there. You know, and I'm glad that, in a sense, I'm glad that I didn't see him like that because I don't think I would have ever got that picture out of my head. It was so surreal. Like, how is this even happening to Nuno? He was such a great person. He caused no harm on anybody. And and when I say that, I'm I'm literal. Like, nobody. He did nothing wrong to anybody. He had such a good heart. And that's why I, I still don't understand because I, I mean, I believe in God, but it's like, I still question, like, why did it have, to, like, why my brother? But no investigation. They didn't ask me any questions. When I arrived, I mean, they were just basically... You can't like they didn't allow it. They didn't allow me to go see him, which I am thankful today that I didn't see my brother that way. But I didn't get to see his phone. I wanted to. I wanted to take it because I wanted to get to the bottom of who gave him these drugs. I want to know who it is and whoever whoever did give him those pills that knew that they weren't real. They're going to have to live with this for the rest of their life. And they they know who they are. Whoever that person that claimed to love my brother and care about my brother, you did it. You did not. And I know my brother, it was, you know, he was an adult, but he was 28. I mean, he, the kid had no, he had no kids, not married, still a full life ahead of him. He hadn't even reached 30 they they robbed my brother from his life. Yes, he, I feel like I'm not going to continue to point the finger at anybody because I know that he made his own decision and he made that gamble. But if he knew that fentanyl was in there and it could have killed him, he wouldn't have taken it. He wanted to live. I have the text messages to prove. He wanted to see his family grow and prosper. He he loved us. The question I've asked myself since his passing is, how will me and my family overcome this? Um, but in his honor, we've actually started a nonprofit organization and our mission is to break generational trauma through the power of love, support, and encouragement, while also spreading awareness to the dangers of fentanyl and opioid use. So I feel like it started with us at home, generations before us, and we want to be able to give back to, you know, our communities and help others, other kids, you know, who might be, you know, who might be going without, you know, I mean, there's just so many different things that I feel like, you know, we could have had growing up, me and my brother, and I speak on his behalf, that there could have been a different outcome. Had he had the support he needed, had, you know, our family members including myself, taking things more seriously and not so lightly. I mean, somebody who has an addiction, it's not, it's not something to be taken lightly. Like, take action and bring an intervention, you know. Talk to your families. Communicate whatever the next person is going through. Fentanyl does not care about your social status. You can be the most intelligent, richest person in the world, and it can hit home. If you think it can't happen to you, it can. If you think it can't happen to your family, it can. This is a public health crisis.